All right, uh, welcome everybody. Eli Sagor here with the University of Minnesota talking to you from the Cloquet Forestry Center today. I'm really glad to welcome you to our August webinar. Uh, this is a webinar with Brian Akama. Brian is going to be talking about mountain pine beetle and the, uh, its current status and, and why we need to be thinking about this species that isn't even here, at least to our knowledge. Uh, I called this our August webinar because, as you probably know, Brian was scheduled initially for August. Um, we had to make a change on SFEC's end to accommodate um, some scheduling things that happened for us. And so uh, this is still our August webinar, but it's happening in September. Um, but I, I kind of was uh, uh, thinking about this earlier. It's entirely fitting to call this our August webinar for another reason, and that's that we have such an august presenter. I looked up the word August, and it's uh, defined as marked by majestic dignity or grandeur. And I can't think of a better way to describe Brian Akama. Um, and it's not that mountainous background. He's uh, truly an august presenter. Uh, this series is brought to you by uh, the Sustainable Forestry Education Cooperative. That's my group based in Cloquet, as well as the University of Minnesota Extension Forestry Team. Um, uh, and as usual, uh, uh, those of you interested in continuing ed credits, look for a link in the chat later on in the presentation, and, uh, and you can fill out a very short form to request those credits. If you have questions for Brian, he is going to pause uh, during the presentation for Q&A. Please use the chat feature to enter those questions. Uh, chat should appear at the bottom of your screen. And with that, uh, Brian, I know you've got a lot to present, so I am going to step aside and the screen is yours. Uh, Brian, I am not hearing you. Oh, I know why that is. That's uh, that's that's on my end. My fault, Brian. I'm sorry. Um, try now. Unmute yourself. There we uh, go. Permission granted. Yep, you're good. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, what is being projected right now? Uh, you are not sharing your screen. There you go. Is that better? There we go. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Eli, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, for this rescheduled webinar. Uh, there were some issues on my end as well. I had some unexpected travel in August. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to see so many people in the room, uh, the virtual room today, to talk about, uh, learn about mountain pine beetle and uh, give you a status update of where we are with our research into its potential for invading the Great Lakes region here. Um, let's see here. Uh, those of you who are familiar with my lab at the University of Minnesota know that uh, we work on a variety of insects of consequence to the forests right here in the Great Lakes region, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, and beyond. And so in this webinar today, I'm gonna to be talking about mountain pine beetle. Um, I'm going to bring in some of the research that we've done in our lab before it was even here at the University of Minnesota. Um, I've worked in Western North America for years. Um, I, I have a 20 year history with mountain pine beetle. And I've always kind of thought when you're dealing with a forest insect challenge, um, especially an invasive species, what you know about how it behaves in its historic range can really inform what you're thinking about as it invades a new region. And so I'm going to bring in some material from Western North America that I ordinarily wouldn't do for a talk like this, just like a status update. Um, um, I owe a, a great debt uh, to many of these students that you're seeing here. Um, I, I've had the good fortune of working with some really, really talented folks, uh, both in my lab in labs with collaborators. Uh, I'm going to be sharing much of their work uh, here this morning. So uh, without further ado, um, other than maybe uh, after that introduction from Eli, I'll point out right down here in the bottom right hand corner, this is a current master student on the project. And his name is August Kramer, and he is an August graduate student. Um, superb. OK, I'm going to break this presentation into three sections this morning. Uh, the first two sections will take about 15 or 20 minutes. I'd like to just cover a little bit of Mountain Pine Beetle 101. Um, I realize not everyone has familiarity with this insect, so we'll just cover off a little bit to orient us uh, 
to the rest of the presentation this morning. Uh, secondly, I'm gonna give a status update on the threat of range expansion. Um, it's just where is mountain pine beetle right now? And then maybe I'll stop there after part two, just for a question or two. We'll keep it really brief. We'll save most of the questions for the end of the talk. Uh, but then I'm, the part three is kind of the meat. Areas of unknown, I'm gonna talk through five different questions that we've been struggling with for mountain pine beetle and could it make its way to the Great Lakes here, Lake States Forest uh, and establish. So with that, let's start with mountain pine beetle. 101. This is the life cycle of mountain pine beetle. It's a bark beetle. Um, it's about the size of a grain of rice. Females are the host selecting sex. So what that means is the female beetles will fly up to a tree. They'll start chewing into the bark. And as they chew into the bark, they release a chemical known as a pheromone. And this pheromone is produced in minute quantities that we can't really smell, but other insects can smell it. And so this pheromone will attract male and female beetles to the tree, and they will also start tunneling into the tree. Beetles are not sterile. They contain a variety of microorganisms such as fungi. Um, and as the beetle starts to tunnel into the tree, it starts to destroy the water conducting tissues. The fungi and yeast will start to establish. Uh, they play a variety of roles in also disrupting the, the vascular system of the tree. Um, and if the beetles are successful, you'll see the females start tunneling vertically just underneath the bark up through the phloem or water conducting layers. And then they'll lay eggs down the sides of those galleries after they mate just underneath the bark. Um, this process happens in late July, early August. Um, it's a very short window. You need a lot of beetles to attack a tree at the same time in order to collectively overwhelm that host. Uh, the eggs will hatch in early fall. So right now in western forests, uh, if you go into an area that's affected by mountain pine beetle, you could peel the bark and you could find wriggling little larvae that are feeding just underneath the bark. And the larvae are the most cold hardy life stage, uh, much more so than the adults or, or pupae. It's the larvae that go through the winter, and then in mid to late spring, they'll turn into pupae. They look like little, yeah, little oval-shaped grubs, and then they'll turn into something called teneral adults. And those teneral adults are basically young adults that aren't quite fully hardened off, so to speak, um, and they'll do some feeding of the fungi that are left underneath the bark. Um, until you get some really nice warm weather, late July, early August, and physiologically, um, there's a well worked out system of cues and the beetles will emerge en masse. And so you get these massive flights of beetles within just a really short time frame because you need large numbers of beetles to collectively colonize new trees, new hosts. So that's kind of the life cycle of mountain pine beetle. Trees, of course, are not passive. Um, most people on this webinar, I'm sure, have worked in forestry and you're familiar with pine resin. And it gets on your you know, work equipment and gloves and it's sticky. And uh, to a beetle, it's also highly toxic. And so you can see this beetle here that's trying to tunnel into the tree. Um, she is not having a good time. Um, that resin is full of noxious chemicals. And so it's a real uh, struggle, literally, for life and death between the beetles trying to get into the tree and the tree trying to fend off the beetles. Um, if the beetles can produce enough aggregation pheromone, you will see a, a large aggregation that occurs like this in a matter of hours. This was a picture of one of my graduate students took. Um, it just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And you can see how many of these bark beetles will land on the surface of the tree they're all trying to chew their way into the tree. And you may have heard me say before, I liken it to death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, and that's, that's really the, the status for the tree if it gets overwhelmed. And you can come back a couple of days later and take a draw knife and peel off some of the bark and you can see some of the galleries underneath the bark. Um, and that's where the females are just starting to construct their egg laying galleries. Um, and the, the beetles essentially uh, killing the tree, chewing it from the inside out, um, so to speak. Now, there are three requirements for an outbreak of mountain pine beetles. The first are suitable winter temperatures. Um, 
And this takes a variety of forms. Generally, the larvae are quite cold hardy, but when temperatures drop below minus 40, um, that will kill them, as will a, an unseasonable cold snap, right, when the beetles are least expecting it. So, you know, you may have noticed where you are the last couple of mornings, you step outside in the morning, you're like, oh, it's, it's starting to feel like fall, maybe I'll grab a, a jacket or something. Um, and uh, to the beetles, it's kind of the same thing. They, they have to harden off and get into winter and come out of winter very slowly. And if you get a really unseasonable cold snap at this time of year, or maybe late in the spring as they're moving towards summer and the temperature drops rapidly, you know, 10 degrees um, colder than normal, uh, that can really set beetle populations back. So they're dependent on favorable climate. The second thing that you need for an outbreak of mountain pine beetle in Western forests are pines. Approximately, you know, that 60 to 100 year age range. Uh, younger trees than that, they can be killed by mountain pine beetle, but really the flown layer underneath the bark is not really thick enough to sustain high numbers of larvae. And so it's kind of a dead end for them. And likewise, older trees are not putting on that large enough growth ring uh, for beetles to, to get in and, and breed in that tissue. Um, so really, uh, it's, it's that prime window of 60, 80, 100, 120 years of age. Um, if you have that established on the landscape, that's really good beetle food. And the third thing that we've kind of already covered, uh, what you really need are plenty and plenty of beetles. And so if you have all three of these things coalescing at the same time in the same place, um, it's not unusual to see uh, maybe one pine tree in your stand be strip attacked on one side, or maybe the entire tree will be colonized. It will turn red the next year. The beetles will migrate at the end of July to new hosts. And you start to see these spot infestations develop um, of 10 to 15 trees. And now this is what we would call moving from an endemic population state to an incipient population state that can go one of two ways. That if there's continued good climate, lots of beetles emerging from these trees, um, suitable you know, pine forest structure, uh, you can have this blow up into a full-blown epidemic. Um, and this is a picture from Western Canada at the height of the largest epidemic of mountain pine beetle in modern recorded history, just over the last 20 years. Um, and you know, historically, if you look at Western stands, you see Mortality to mature pines on the order of you know, 70, 75 percent. Uh, but we see areas of Western Canada where 99 to 100 percent of the older pines being just decimated um, and huge, huge landscape level impacts, um, you know, effects on carbon budgets uh, and, and everything else. So major, major problems. And this outbreak will then just keep rolling along because you have so many beetles until one of two things happens. You will either see um, simply run out of suitable host, uh, so they just can't find any more trees, or you have an unseasonably cold weather event. Um, just uh, you know, a, a, a drop in temperatures or a cold snap down to you know, minus 45, minus 50 degrees, and that will stop an impending outbreak. Um, kind of in its tracks, or at least put a, put a pause on it. So that's kind of Mountain Pine Beetle 101. Um, now what I'd like to do is talk just a little bit about the threat of range expansion and give a bit of a status update on where we are with Mountain Pine Beetle. Um, so you may have seen me share this map before from one of our PhD students, Derek Rosenberger. This area in red on the left-hand side of the screen is the historic range of mountain pine beetle. And a number of years ago, the beetle got over the Rocky Mountains into this area of Northwestern Alberta, Canada. Um, we had some, you know, a warming climate. Uh, the beetle didn't stop where it usually does. And it got into this area here where we have a lot of jack pine. The historic hosts in Western North America are ponderosa pine and lodgepole pine. Um, when the beetle moved into jack pine, it created a lot of concern that it might go further through the Canadian boreal forest into pines that we have here in the Lake States region. Not only jack pine, but white pine, red pine, the European imports, Scotch pine. Um, and uh, 
lot, a lot of focus uh, on that issue. The other thing that we're a little bit concerned about is looking at the historic range of mountain pine beetle being in the Black Hills of South Dakota, which is less than 500 miles from Minnesota. Um, that's not that far as the crow flies, and we're starting to pay a little bit more attention to could the insect actually come across the plains there and infest the beetle on you know, timber that's moved or something like that, infest our, our trees here in Minnesota. Um, I borrowed this slide here from my good colleague, Alan Carroll at the University of British Columbia. Um, this was some work that he did uh, just a couple of years ago with Barry Cook with the Canadian Forest, looking at the current status of mountain pine beetle um, in Northwestern uh, North America, Canada there. Um, this area in red, this is kind of the, the displacement that they saw from 2007 to 2011, the beetle moved farther north, where there's still a lot of lodgepole pine. And it has moved all the way up to the, to the Northwest Territory, the Yukon Territory, excuse me. Um, and it's moving east uh, towards the province here of Saskatchewan. And this red line is basically where the insect is firmly established. But I can tell you that, you know, we, they picked up some scattered trees here, uh, just a little bit east of Fort McMurray, even um, down to, to Cold Lake, where the beetle has not necessarily established very well, but it has killed trees. And Canada invests millions in spread control. And they do aerial survey flights, government contracted, a really well worked out system of identifying fading trees um, every year, going in with helicopter crews, uh, kind of rap attack that you might use for forest fire, uh, get on those little spot infestations, cut the trees, pluck them, pile them over the stump, a little bit of diesel fuel, light it, uh, and try to control the beetle populations that way with some really good success. Um, so that's kind of the, the status right now in Western Canada. Um, kind of a pause, it's not moving very fast, um, seems to be static in the last few years. So some, some reason for optimism other than the beetle is still established in those jack pine forests and could pick up its pace at a later date, moving eastward through the Canadian Boreal towards Minnesota. Um, when we think about the insect coming across the plains, um, you know, South Dakota, some of the prairie region there from perhaps the Black Hills. Our colleagues at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture did some uh, just some voluntary inspections of some of these entities that were importing lodgepole pine um, and other tree species from Western North America for use in things like, you know, log home building or whatever. Um, 10 years ago, just to see, like, is this something that we should really be concerned about? And they found, um, you know, in, in one of their first inspections, that yes, there were mountain pine beetle in some of the bark on some of this lodgepole pine that was coming in from a state like Montana. Um, and, uh, you know, just some education that like, wow, this is, this is really potentially a, a serious issue. Maybe we should, you know, not encourage these, process, these practices. Um, I have to highlight the insects were dead. So no live mountain pine beetle in Minnesota. They did not establish. We have done surveys since. We have not found any mountain pine beetle live in Minnesota in any of our traps. Um, but it's just good awareness to, to consider, especially given some of the past um, stories of insects other than mountain pine beetle. Um, this picture right here is my predecessor in forest insect science at the University of Minnesota. This is the late Steve Seibold. Um, and he's smiling here. He's looking at a vial of uh, Douglas spur beetle. Steve and his colleague Mike Albers there in the background uh, with the Minnesota DNR, who I think many of you know on this webinar, um, they were trapping some Eastern larch beetles. And one of the students in the lab were identifying 60,000 beetles and found three that didn't quite look like Eastern larch beetles and realized they were Douglas spur beetle, but upon further investigation, they found that they were coming from imported Western larch lungs um, into the States. And Douglas spur beetle was trapped in the next couple of years. It seems to have just died out, but it was a kissing cousin of mountain pine beetle. It came in on a different species, established at least for a short time. And we're thinking about, you know, mountain pine beetle, we're, pretty, we're very worried that, you know, if it did come in and establish, it might be here 
for longer than just a short time. So why don't I stop there just briefly. We'll take a moment. Eli, if you want to see if there's any questions. Yes, we've got a couple, Brian. Um, like EAB, can mountain pine beetles survive under the snow line in trees, even at sub 40 degree temperatures? If the temperature does not get to minus 40 degrees, yes, it will survive. And you mean the temperature at the beetle, not the temperature at, on a... At the beetle, yes, that's what's critical. Would a large enough, and, and that I, I say that because uh, uh, you know under the bark or any insulating snow or anything like that, that's, that's the point. Uh, next question, would a large enough mountain pine beetle disjunct population be able to travel through urban forests uh, and pines in those urban forests into Minnesota? Or are urban forests not populated enough with pine? Uh, that's a great question. And from my experiences in Western Canada, urban forests, um, if there are pine trees, yes, the, the trees will absolutely die. As far as how many beetles those trees can produce uh, to keep spreading, it depends, of course, on the number of trees. But just for me, living in the city of Prince George, British Columbia, when the mountain pine beetle epidemic came through, um, one year, the golf course had trees, mostly lodgepole pine. The next year, it was a lynx course. Not a single pine tree left, gone, which definitely changes the game of golf. And, and for me, that was for the better. Yeah. Um, okay, Brian, we got one more, and then I know I know you got a lot more to cover. So maybe after this, when we yeah. move on, we can see where we stand. But the, sure. the next question is, what do post-mountain pine beetle forests look like 10, 20, or 30 years out? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you, you have a lot of dead mature trees, uh, depending on the climate, it'll depend on how fast they check, how fast they might fall down, uh, disturbances like that. And then you will see, you know, especially after forest fire or something like that, uh, you'll, you'll see new, new seedlings come up, especially in a, a species like lodgepole or even jack pine. So. Uh, great. Uh, and that's all we've got for now, Brian. So uh, you're, yeah. you can resume. Very good. Thanks for those questions. So now what I'd like to do is talk about five different areas of unknown um, that we've been thinking about with mountain pine beetle moving towards Minnesota. Um, the first question is, is the forest structure suitable? Knowing what we know about the age structure of susceptible pines out west, um, a very fair question, like do we have the same pines and the same age structure, realizing they're different species, of course. Um, I can't take any credit for answering this question, but my good colleague, Marcel Winmuller Campioni, who I think many of us on this uh, webinar know, uh, has done some great work just in the last few years. Um, and I think she's probably shared this graph from one of her publications with me before. I'm not gonna dwell on it very long. Uh, but she's classified some of the FIA plot data into knowing what they do about Western pines, assuming the rules hold, uh, you know, do we have low, moderate, high suitability here in our current forest structure? And basically wherever you see, uh, you know, red or, or yellow there on the screen, moderate to high, and you will know, see a lot of dots. Yes, it looks like there are vast tracks of our, our lake states forests um, that might be suitable forest structure for mountain pine beetle. The second area, and this is where I start to contribute some of my work uh, with various students, is, is the climate suitable for the insects. We know it is out west as it moves here through to potentially the Great Lakes region. Um, what would that look like? Um, now, experimentally, we have some challenges that we have no interest in moving mountain pine beetle to Minnesota where it would be much easier to work with. So what we do is we take our, our pines from Minnesota, Eastern white pine, jack pine, red pine, Scots pine. We cut them out of the Cloquet Forestry Center, load them onto trucks. We take them out to the Black Hills of South Dakota and we do experiments with them there um, with as well as uh, those species, we compare them to the historic hosts of mountain pine, like lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine. Um, 
So I'm going to describe here in brief uh, an experiment where we infested logs artificially uh, of all these different pine species, some from Minnesota, some from out west. Um, and this bottom picture here on the left, you can see this little plastic tube. Uh, and it's full of this, this sawdust here. And what we've done is we've put a mountain pine beetle in that tube. We've drilled into the log just a little bit through the bark. We place that tube in place and then the beetles will tunnel in and start to produce the sawdust. You know that they're established in, in those logs. And so what we've done is infested 48 logs of these different um, species. And then we do that in the summer, right when mountain pine beetle is flying. And then we leave them all outside and this is kind of a two-part experiment. We took some of these logs back to Minnesota. So these logs are full of mountain pine beetle, but they're not fully developed. Uh, we bring them back to the lab here under some very strict quarantine requirements. And we could peel off the bark um, and see how many eggs do the females lay? Do they hatch? Are they OK? Do these trees look like in the middle of winter, like they have developing brood in them? Um, the second thing that we've done is then leave the rest of these out in South Dakota and we bring them into a lab there in which we work um, and, and we put them in these rearing chambers here. And they're basically big cardboard paper rolls uh, that we close off both ends. We put the emergence jar on and any insects that develop the full year life cycle, they come out into these jars and we can collect them the next year. And so two-part experiment, we're looking at, you know, how the population is doing in these logs that we've invested midway through the winter. And then we see what comes out of the other half of the logs that haven't been disturbed uh, later on the next summer. And so uh, this here is reproduction relative to lodgepole pine. Uh, if you see a bar go above this black line through the middle of the plot, it means that the trees have more beetles than would have been expected from the historic host lodgepole pine. Uh, if the bar is below that, it's slightly less. Um, what we do is we, we add letters to the bars, and you can use these for comparisons. If a bar has the same letter or uh, a shared letter like A, uh, that means statistically these are similar. Uh, so therefore, like A is different from B here. So you get a few more beetles out of ponderosa pine than you would from lodgepole. These are our, our Western hosts. Uh, but what I want you to take away from this is the grain bars on the right-hand side in the middle of winter. The number of mountain pine beetle larvae and brood that we have in those logs looks functionally identical to everything that we would see out west. So this was kind of our first experiment where we were like, okay, so we're going to infest the logs. What happens if you use you know, white pine or red pine? And it looks like the beetles are quite at home. They were doing just fine. Now, this was an experiment that we did a few years ago uh, in 2013 and 2014. And uh, I want to draw your attention to this little dip here in 2014. Um, there was an unseasonable cold snap that happened in about the second week of November, right down to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, and that, we hypothesized, might do a little bit of a number on the beetles. And when we checked what was coming out of our trees the next year, we found that the insects in jack pine did just fine. But if you notice here, the gray bars, they're kind of short with red, eastern white, and scotch pine. Uh, we got very poor reproduction in, in those hosts. And we were a little bit surprised. We were like, well, they seem to be doing fine partway through the winter. After the winter, after that cold snap, we didn't get very many insects out. Why is that? Did they dry out? Was there something not nutritionally acceptable about you know, red pine, eastern white pine, scotch pine? Um, what, what seems to be happening there? Um, I'm going to show you two more graphs with this work. Um, the first is that we were also doing some cold sensitivity assays in the laboratory. Uh, this was done in conjunction with Robert Burnett uh, here with the U.S. Forest Service um, on campus, and, and he is a world leader in cold tolerance physiology. Um, and basically, the longer this bar is, uh, the more cold hardy a life stage is. And you can see here, we tested like 310 larvae and they're you know, cold hardy down to, at that point of the winter, down to minus 30 Celsius. Um, and they can get even more cold sensitive to that. But you notice here like the pupae or the young adults, male and female tenor adults, um, 
they were not very cold tolerant, uh, as we might expect from, from Western studies. And so what we saw happening, especially when we put this together with some of our, our other data on when the insects emerged. Um, so this is a graph here with our two historic hosts up top here, Ponderosa and Lodgepole Pine. This is how fast the progeny emerge from when we infested the logs, okay? So this dashed line here is 365 days. This is a perfect one year generation time. And so this is keeping the beetle on schedule. But if you're in Western North America, you're gonna come out every single year around July 25. And you need to come out then because all of the other beetles are coming out then. And then you have time to lay your eggs and get to the you know, larval stages by winter. You'll notice that Jack, especially red pine, um, some other pines here, they're all to the left. They're a couple of weeks short of that one year life cycle. And in summary, what we were seeing was that many of these insects in cut logs, not live trees, but at least cut logs of our pines here from Minnesota were developing faster than a one year generation. And so when we infested the logs all at the same time, some of the progeny, some of the young beetles went from egg to larvae to pupae and even some temporal adult stages faster than they should have, faster than they expected. Um, and so when the winter came and they got that cold snap, they died much quicker. So we're not quite sure what to make of all of this. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting in the fact that we know that at least our pines appear suitable Beetles can reproduce in them, but at least using cut logs and, you know, it is a little bit artificial. We don't know if this was like slow down in live trees, but cut logs for all of this. Um, historicos, Ponderosa and Lodgepole pine, they develop in one year. Using pines from Minnesota, they develop faster than that. Um, and, you know, could that suggest that if the beetle got here, it might actually go into a life cycle that's not quite optimized. You know, would they start coming out too early in, you know, end of June or July? What would that mean for getting through the winter? So kind of following that. Um, let's see, third question that we're looking at. Uh, will host defenses fend off beetle attack? Um, Pines out west are used to seeing mountain pine beetle and they can try to fend off the beetle attacks. Our trees here in Minnesota are not so used to seeing mountain pine beetle um, and they don't necessarily produce as much resin as the trees out west. If you've done any western forestry, you, you've probably noticed that with things like lodgepole pine. Um, they can emit resin and it is nasty to beetles. It contains a toxic soup um, to bark beetles trying to tunnel into the tree. Uh, and essentially, the, the you know, beetles are left trying to swim through this and get into the tree uh, so they can lay their eggs and, and mate. Um, these are some experiments that Celia Boone did back 10 years ago. And we would go into stands before mountain pine beetle seemed to be erupting in these stands. And we would go through and we would take little plugs of fungi associated with mountain pine beetle. And we would put these into the tree as kind of a surrogate for a mountain pine beetle attack. And then we could come back a number of days later and we could chisel out a little section of bark and we could see how long uh, an immune response deletion was um, in the tree to see if it had recognized and tried to fend off a mountain pine beetle attack from this fungal plug. Um, or we could put in these resin samplers and collect resin coming from the tree um, and then we could analyze what was in that resin. And what we found was that the host defenses of the trees would increase with higher beetle populations. And so on the left-hand side here, this axis is, is terpenes. It's a component, it's a, it's a very poisonous component of the resin. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of, of chemical. Um, don't worry so much about the constitutive or induced. I'd go into that more if I had more time here. But uh, what I'd like you to take away from this is that in trees or in stands where we had very few beetles, you would find, you know, the resin would contain a few terpenes. But as you got into stands that had more and more beetles flying around, the terpenes that the trees were emitting, um, the resin 
sorry, that the trees were emitting was just loaded with terpenes. And it brings to mind, you know, the father of modern toxicology from the you know, 1700s, Paracelsus. Uh, he, he had a quip in Latin, dosis sola facit venenum, uh, the dose makes the poison. And so the trees are producing resin and they're loading it with these toxic terpene compounds trying to kill the beetles. Celia had data on hundreds of trees. And what she could do then was answer a question about how outbreaks progress. And so she could characterize, you know, okay, so we have this many trees at the endemic state, which is the few beetles that really aren't producing many of these toxic terpenes in the resin. Um, and once you have more beetles, there seems to be more trees that are producing uh, lots and lots of this toxic terpene. Uh, blend in the resin uh, up to a few trees that are just loaded with this, just absolutely loaded. Poison tree, stay away if you're a bark beetle. Um, we could then look at, you know, watching these trees that we had sampled to see which ones were eventually colonized by mountain pine beetle. And we could get some ideas about do the beetles work from the bottom, from the weakest trees up to the strongest trees, uh, as we might expect, they kind of, you know, thin from below, so to speak. What Celia found was quite unexpected, and that is that the beetles will move to the most well-defended hosts once they have the numbers. And so this, this x-axis here, we have a percentile distribution of tree defenses from very weak to very strong. Population density of insects from endemic stands, just a few beetles up to epidemic stands. And after having, you know, this blood pressure check, so to speak, on all these trees, we could go through and figure out like, okay, now we know what the population looks like, which trees are being colonized. And you can see here at endemic levels, the beetles are simply taking the weakest trees in the stand. And in incipient levels, you know, it's not down here um, or epidemic, it's not, over here, the beetles are simply going to, by epidemic proportions, uh, the strongest and most well-defended trees in the stand. They don't care what's in the resin, they're gonna get through it uh, and take the biggest and the best. And so what we learned in Western Canada was that outbreaks kind of progress like this, that beetles will jump from the weakest trees into kind of a middling tree that they can get into to create those kind of spot clusters of 10 to 15 trees. And then once they have the numbers, they will preferentially move to the most well-defended trees that they can find. And it's, you know, I, I was working with a colleague who, who quipped, why knock off a, a liquor store when you can rob a bank? Um, if you can get into those super big, juicy, well-defended trees, um, the, the payoff for your kids is phenomenal. Um, great, great host resource. So they'll work then backwards by taking out the strongest and moving back down to the weakest. And we have no idea if that pattern would hold here in Minnesota, in Michigan. Um, and, and we have to start thinking a little bit hard about you know, some of these, these concepts of like beetle proofing a stand, thinning from below, it works if you're in really early and you can you know, take care of those endemic populations before you get a big flight of beetles that come into a really nice stand uh, that would potentially create a lot of havoc. Um, so yeah, Western forests, we have an idea now how this works mechanistically um, just in the last 10 years. We have an understanding now of why beetle proofing works and when it does, but we have no idea how that would translate to tree defenses here in the Great Lakes region. And it's really difficult to do many of these experiments um, because we simply can't bring the beetle or the fungus to our host trees here in Minnesota or Michigan or Wisconsin. So create some challenges in doing these experiments. All right, two more areas of, of unknown that I'll try to cover uh, fairly quickly now. I see in about 40 minutes. Um, we're really concerned about how the beetles might integrate into our regional forest here that have their own suite of native bark beetles and native predators. Um, in Western forests, mountain pine beetle exists for long, long periods of time, decades, in endemic modes when they're not killing trees. 
And they're coexisting in some of these really weak trees, uh, wind throw, snap, slash from forestry, with some of these bark beetles. And they've kind of learned how to get along until such a point that mountain pine beetle can start mass attacking trees again when they have you know, lots of beetles, lots of posts, suitable climate. Um, this suite of species that we see out west is different from what we have in Minnesota. Um, so we've done some experiments with one of our native Minnesota bark beetles, Skips grandicolis, and this is a pine engraver beetle. And one of our graduate students, Zach Smith, just did some experiments looking at, like, are they attracted at all to pheromones of mountain pine beetle? If mountain pine beetle is attacking a tree, would we see our native bark beetles come in and try to attack the same tree and potentially compete or outcompete mountain pine beetle? Um, Nobody's ever done that experiment because these two species have never historically coexisted. Um, so what we would do is cut some logs. Again, in Cloquet, we would take them out to the Black Hills. This picture on the right is we're working in a forest with mountain pine beetle. And this is a jack pine log. And you can see a little white packet there. And that's a pheromone packet. Um, and we could put that on the tree and see or on that log there that's hanging there, we can see, you know, do pine engravers. And, and this Ips grandicolis has just moved into the Black Hills now. Um, it's endemic to that population. And we're looking at, you know, will it come in to these logs baited with mountain pine beetle pheromone or is it gonna leave it alone? Um, what we could do is, is take those logs back out of the field after they're exposed for a couple of weeks to flying insects. Um, and we can see, uh, you know, what comes out of those logs into our emergence jars. You can see here bark beetles coming into the jars. Um, and then we can also peel the bark off and we can measure the areas underneath the bark that were colonized by different species of bark beetles. And they create different galleries and uh, allow you to see exactly who was there at what time and how far along they developed. Um, this graph here, the take home is that Ips grandicolis just completely avoids pheromones of mountain pine beetle. Um, this is a little bit of a complicated graph because we did different combinations of baiting with or without this Ips grandicolis lure. This is our, our native Minnesota pine engraver here that's also present in the Black Hills. Um, and so, you know, as, as you can see here, we, we have some that are you know, some logs that we did not have a lure for the pine engraver and some that we did. And as expected, we will see lots of Ips grandicolis coming into the logs that are baited with their lure um, that contain their synthetic pheromone. Uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is this light gray bar is logs that we did not bait with mountain pine beetle lure. And this dark gray bar that's much lower is where we did put mountain pine beetle lure. Um, and we see a statistical difference between the two. And so it seems that Ips grandicolis would definitely avoid pheromones of mountain pine beetle. When we looked at what else was in the log, we had some surprises. Uh, we noticed some pine sawyers, and you might be familiar with these longhorn beetles, endemic to Minnesota and the Black Hills region. Um, you know, these really big beetles with long antennae. Uh, they'll come in and they'll lay their eggs and their larvae will just chew through everything underneath the bark. And they'll, they'll eat bark beetles that might be in the way. They'll eat flown tissue of the tree. They really don't care. Uh, if it's in the way, they're going to munch on it. Um, and we didn't see any differences whatsoever with how we baited these logs with mountain pine beetle lure or pine engraver lure. Um, pine sawyers just to seem to come into these logs and just mow through just about everything. Um, we were overrun with pine sawyers. They would just come in and, and chew things up. Um, so the take home from some of that suggests that, you know, one of our most prevalent native bark beetles, uh, Ips grandicolis, would likely avoid trees being colonized by mountain pine beetle, at least at the initial stage. They might come in a little bit later to a different part of the tree that's not utilized. Um, but we also saw kind of unexpectedly that native pine sawyers could be a significant source of mortality to mountain pine beetles if it were to come into Minnesota. But I put an asterisk with that because overall, we saw between two and 10 times fewer pine engravers here in Minnesota than we did in um, the Black Hills uh, using some other trapping experiments and I'm not 
uh, describing right now. Um, so pine soreners, much higher populations in the Black Hills of South Dakota. They could be a, a source of mortality, but at the same time in the Black Hills, we see huge outbreaks of mountain pine beetle through the, through the past decades. So we're not looking at pine sawyers as you know, potentially a saving grace to protect our, our region's forests. So um, as far as, as other bark beetles uh, and predators, uh, when bark beetles are attacking the tree, they emit pheromones that other insects can also smell. And so this is a checker beetle. This is a predaceous beetle that will land on the bark. It'll grab a bark beetle before it gets into the tree. Um, you may have seen this yourself in the forest, uh, attacking our, our native bark beetles. Clara beetles will basically grab the, the insect, flip it over, clip off all the legs, break it in two, and then scoop out the insides as fast as they can. Um, and, and I, I bring these into my office. I can watch them on my desk. It's, it's kind of a, a gruesome show. Um, and uh, this is another picture of a, a checkered claret beetle. And here the bark beetle has been decapitated and the claret is going in through the chest cavity, right down into the, uh, the soft abdominal tissues there of the bark beetle. A very, very efficient predator that cues in on the pheromones. We did a number of experiments looking at deploying uh, not only our native pine engraver pheromones, but also some different mountain pine beetle pheromones. Um, in regions of Minnesota, where we do not have mountain pine beetle, and also South Dakota, the Black Hills, where mountain pine beetle does exist. We were just kind of curious, like, can these checkered beetles find mountain pine beetle? Do they respond to the pheromone? They've never seen mountain pine beetle before. Maybe they respond to the pheromone. Um, we're not quite sure. Um, this graph here at the top is the experiments that we have done in Minnesota. The bottom graph are experiments that we've done in South Dakota. So again, top, no mountain pine beetle in our forests. Bottom, these are forests that have mountain pine beetle. Um, the, uh, the left hand right here, the control, this is simply an unbaited trap that we don't see anything coming into. The gray bars here, these are baited with pine engraver pheromones. Uh, a couple of compounds that Pips Grandicolis and some of our other pine engravers will produce. And the green here are some experimental mountain pine beetle pheromones uh, that we were testing. And so, for example, for these checkered beetles that eat adult bark beetles, um, in Minnesota, as we would expect, they respond quite well to pine engraver pheromones. They're used to feeding on our native pine engravers in our forests here. If we put out mountain pine beetle pheromone, you can see here, nothing. Um, functionally the same as an unbaited trap. Our checkered beetle predators here in Minnesota just do not recognize mountain pine beetle. So if it were to come in, yeah, the beetles you know, just kind of not really realize it, at least at the, at the tree colonizing stage. Um, and, you know, if we look at South Dakota, uh, some very low responses because, you know, this predator is not present in South Dakota in the Black Hills region. They have other, other clarids, but we were focused on this one. Um, for reasons of time, I'm not going to, to talk about the other two, but we have other predators uh, that we've also done some work on. And again, seeing really, really weak um, recognition of these cues. Um, so, at least locally. So what we've seen doing some surveys, uh, perhaps for like anticipatory biological control at some point in the future, uh, predators show really strong fidelity to cues associated with local prey. If they've seen it before, they know it, they'll feed on it. Um, but some of our predaceous insects may not optimally recognize mountain pine beetle, at least the pheromone that's coming off the tree if the insect were to arrive. Um, so perhaps not unexpected, but a little bit disconcerting. Um, the last area of unknown is, you know, could these beetles blow at large numbers and make it here to Minnesota, um, you know, being 400 miles away from uh, the Black Hills. This is a Doppler radar, uh, non-precipitation radar event. Uh, this loop was captured 15 years ago in Western Canada, this is a cloud of bark beetles. This is a cloud of mountain pine beetle that is blowing, you know, they get into these abductive updrafts and blow long, long ways away. And 
you know, we, we've seen in some of the forestry work that we do in Western Canada, especially, you'll come to like a lake shore and you'll see thousands of beetles washing up um, on the lake shore as they rain down out of the sky after these massive flights, um, lots and lots. Uh, last couple of years, we've been doing some dispersal transects, working uh, especially in some areas with really good mountain pine beetle populations out in Montana. Um, and we'll set up these transects of traps through the forest where they have good outbreaks of mountain pine beetle all the way out into the prairies. And when I say we go out into the prairies, we literally go out as far as we can to areas where we have to look for the tree. Um, and when we find the tree, we'll put a trap on the tree and we'll see, you know, if we bait it with mountain pine beetle, far, far away from any pine tree, um, can we catch mountain pine beetle falling out of the sky? And we, we've been really surprised. We can catch thousands of beetles in the forest. And, you know, if we go 30 miles out past the forest where there's not a pine tree for miles, uh, we can catch beetles that are still responding to the pheromone. And so it gets at some of these questions, um, you know, could they use shelter belts? Could they use urban forests as a bit of a, a stepping stone and play hopscotch and get further to uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan? So remaining questions, uh, we, we have a lot of questions still about mountain pine beetle, the risk, approaches that we could take. Um, one of the most interesting questions that, that I'm still interested in is how does mountain pine beetle persist in the Black Hills during endemic periods? Uh, we know out in Western Canada that it kind of tucks in with some of these lesser known bark beetles. And it just kind of piddles along year to year to year to year until it gets enough insects, uh, other mountain pine beetle to mass attack a tree. Um, this is August Kramer. This is the graduate student, and we were out in, uh, in the Black Hills National Forest oh, about six weeks ago, and we came across this ponderosa pine that had been hit by lightning. And as we started pulling off some of the bark, uh, we found some gallery patterns that looked like, hey, this might actually have Ips grandicolis, and it might have some mountain pine beetle too. And so like I mentioned, this Ips grandicolis, this, this native Minnesota pine engraver, is now in the Black Hills. And it's, it's uh, a westward invasion that few people are really paying very much attention to because it's just a pine engraver beetle. Um, we're really interested in how it's assimilating into the ecosystem in the Black Hills. Is it, is it facilitating the persistence of mountain pine beetle? What lessons are there that we could take that might inform how mountain pine beetle might assimilate into Great Lakes ecosystems here. Um, so something that we're kind of monitoring. Um, other questions, defensive responses of live trees. Again, this is a really challenging, challenging topic to study when you can't bring mountain pine beetle. We don't want to bring mountain pine beetle to live red pine, white pine here. Um, minimum population sizes, you know, if we don't really know what the defensive capacity is of naive trees here in Minnesota, would it take fewer beetles to establish a population? Um, the developmental rate, why do beetles develop so rapidly here? Um, is, it, is, it, is there something more nutritious about our trees here in Minnesota? What would that do to the life cycle? Um, our insect predators, you know, we, We've sampled a few, um, you know, would they adapt? Uh, if so, how fast? Um, you know, just some things we're, we're not quite sure about. But to wrap this up, um, the immediate threat of mountain pine beetle reaching the lake states is low. I have to emphasize we have not captured any mountain pine beetle in Minnesota. Um, and right now, if you look in Western Canada, it has kind of gone into stasis. The range front is not expanding as, as much as it did 10 years ago. Um, in the Black Hills of South Dakota, our nearest populations are right now at an endemic level. That outbreak kind of went into a pause, a stop in 2013-14. We're not seeing huge numbers of beetles. Um, but that said, we know enough about the species of pines appearing suitable here. We can rear 
in the laboratory, mountain pine beetle through all of our native pine species here. Suitable is different than susceptible. And so for live trees, you know, the question is still like, how would that be effective? Um, so there are many more uh, questions about ecosystem resilience that remain, uh, but many are, are difficult to test. So uh, I'm not going to you know, read through all of these. There, there's a number of academic journal articles. This is a not exhaustive list. Um, but if you have questions about any of this material, feel free to get in contact with me. I'm happy to share some of those resources, uh, help translate them as necessary. Um, thanks to many people who have made our work in mountain pine beetle ecology possible over the last 10 years here in Minnesota, but even before that in Western Canada, um, we, we have a fantastic team that I'm very, very appreciative for. And with that, uh, I'm going to stop Eli and invite any questions. I see that there are a number in the chat. So, there are several, uh, but not an overwhelming number. I think we've got four unanswered questions, plus some things that I've posted. Um, uh, first question from a uh, uh, repeat uh, attendee uh, who spent a lot of his career in Arkansas. Is it possible that mountain pine beetle could eventually invade the southern pine forests? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You do find it uh, in the West Coast, you know, right down through California. Um, I know that David Coyle at the University of Georgia has been interested in that question. Uh, and we actually had some plans to test some of the southern species of pines. Um, if you look at what's happening with southern pine beetle, Dendrochthonus frontalis, uh, again, a kissing cousin of mountain pine beetle, very prevalent in southern states like Arkansas. Um, it has been moving north over the last number of years. It is now moving north on the East Coast and it's farther north than it's ever been before. And as the climate continues to change, as species move around, uh, you know, unfortunately, we'll probably get some answers to some of those great questions. Um, I am going to go through these last few questions, but looking at the time, it's now two minutes before the hour. I just want to acknowledge that we're getting close to the end of our time. Those of you interested in Continuing Ed credits, be sure to look in the chat for a link. You need to complete that very short form to get those credits recorded. I also put a link to our September webinar, which is next week on the Voyager Wolf Project. And Brian, I don't know how, uh, you know, if, if you have another commitment right at 10 or what, uh, if you're available, we can continue to work through these remaining three questions. Uh, but I wanted to draw folks' attention to those two things in the chat. Um, uh, next question, any guesses uh, to explain why mountain pine beetles develop faster in Minnesota or Lake States pine species? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we've been wondering, is it something with the, the microbial content um, that they just do better? There's more nutrition for the beetles in, in our pine trees. Could it be the sort of phenomenon that the, the live tree defensive responses uh, might slow the beetle down a little bit. Um, although that said, you know, using cut bolts, ponderosa, lodgepole, pine, you know, they still stuck to a 365 day uh, uh, cycle and jack pine did as well uh, for the most part. And jack pine is closely related to lodgepole pine. So uh, we're, not, we're not quite sure why they're moving so quickly. Um, yeah. Next question, any evidence that pines are evolving to better defend against mountain pine beetle? Uh, yes, I mean, if you look at historic Western ecosystems, uh, you know, what, what's, it, it's basically an arms race. Uh, it's the beetles trying to take down the strongest trees, uh, the trees that, sur that survive. Uh, can pass along those defensive traits that work really well to their young progeny through their seed cone bank. Um, and so it's, there, there, there's been a lot of research and scholarship on that kind of evolutionary arms race between the pine and the beetles. Um, that one is trying to defeat the other um, and on and on it goes. What would happen when you take mountain pine beetle out of that into the lake states, you know, like I've said, is, is a little bit of a guess. Um, you know, 
uh, I know for myself, you know, I, I did my graduate training at the University of Wisconsin. I was used to working in red pine stands. And when I first started, you know, working with lodgepole pine in Montana, I was, I was just amazed at, you know, you, you put a punch into a tree and you get copious amounts of resin that would come out. And I was like, this is very different than what I'm used to. And so just like me experiencing some of these trees for the first time, it might happen in reverse from mountain pine beetle. And what that would look like, especially in an evolutionary context, I, I'm not sure. Next question, are mountain pine beetles coordinating or communicating to attack well-defended trees? And if so, how? Or is this simply a function of increasing population numbers as the outbreak progresses? Curious if behavior or pattern is deliberate or incidental. That is a fantastic question. Um, there is experimental evidence that some of the behavior uh, is actually adaptable. Um, there's no question, though, that it is a, just a bit of a numbers game. When you have that many more beetles uh, attacking the trees, um, you know, they can identify the trees that have those terpene chemicals and other chemicals. Um, and if you look at just the, the way pheromone communication works, the beetles will actually use some of those terpenes as precursors to produce their own pheromones. Um, and so they're actually using the tree's defenses against it. And so the more that the tree produces, the more it can elicit attack through the beetles as a focal point on that tree. But great question. Really appreciate that. Wow. Uh, last question, I think we'll call it after this one. Um, how well does Western white pine do with mountain pine beetle in comparison to how well our Eastern white pine may do or not do? Uh, that is a question. That, that is a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that right off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I know that Western white pine is susceptible to mountain pine beetle. Um, as far as you know, comparisons to Eastern white pine, um, you know, mountain pine beetle has not been an eastern white pine. Outside of some anecdotal reports that you can find scattered here and there in arboreta that have been attacked in western states. Like, for example, the University of Idaho, they have an arboretum. And when we started this work about 10 years ago, mountain pine beetle outbreak in Idaho, and it went through the arboretum. And they could see that, yes, you know, we're having some eastern white pine that are there that are being attacked and killed and progeny are coming out of the white pine. Um, but those are kind of, you know, anecdotal. Sometimes in our arboretum, you know, you have one or two specimen trees representative of the species. They're growing off-site. They're not necessarily that representative of the species as a whole, growing in a, a proper site like we might see in Wisconsin or Michigan. So um, yeah, hard, hard to answer that question comparatively. All right. And with that, I think I'm going to call us to a close. Brian, thank you so much for a great presentation, as always, and for sticking with us a few minutes beyond our scheduled end. I appreciate that. And I'm sure the folks asking questions did as well. Um, so really appreciate your taking the time to do this. Uh, for uh, others who are still on the line, I hope you'll join us next week as well for our September webinar. That's going to be a good one, I'm sure, with Joseph Bump talking about uh, an update on the Voyager Wolf project. There's been some really interesting video and, and uh, interesting findings from that project recently uh, focused on summer behavior of wolves in northern Minnesota. Brian, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.